So we're in Jeremiah 31 to start with tonight. Um, In our series on the history of the Holy Spirit uh, in the life of a believer, (coughs) we've been through the Old Testament history. We've been, we looked at the prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the changes that were to come. We've been through the history of the Gospels and the, the, the imminent uh, transition from Old to New Covenant and it starts to happen at the end of the Gospels. And we've been through the book of Acts and seen that transition happen and be finished off practically. And last week we had a look at where we are now as New Covenant believers today, the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives, um, certainly with regards to this coming upon or being in and what have you that we've been looking at throughout this series. Um, There are some elements of uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit today that I'm not going to cover in detail in this series. (coughs) Specifically, I don't want to get into a big divisive discussion on the gifts of the Spirit. Um, We will be dealing with the gifts of the Spirit very, very soon in the mornings because we're going to be dealing with Ephesians chapter 4, which talks about the giving of the gifts and how that fits in. And uh, I kind of feel that the giving of gifts is optional in this series. It's something I can slot in there, but it's something that can be left out. But seeing as if I did do it, I would pretty much be teaching Ephesians 4 and then a few weeks later doing it again in the morning. I kind of have opted away from that. So what I want to do tonight is to begin our journey from the present to the future. So the history of the Holy Spirit, of course, we say this word history, we, we think we're always looking behind us. But if from God's perspective, the history, the history of the Holy Spirit goes right through to our future. And so that's where we're kind of going off to. And to do that, we're going to begin our studies of the future by looking at a problem and an issue that hasn't yet been resolved. So we're in Jeremiah 31, and uh, we've, we've been in this passage already in our Old Testament studies. We're now going to pick up in verse 31 with this new covenant, um, a passage we've looked at, um, and we've seen others backing it up. We could turn to several passages here, but this is the most obvious one. And so just to read it again, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, but I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Now, in that initial two verses, there is an astonishing amount that is there. Um, There are days coming in the future... God is saying that there will be a new covenant. Now that new covenant is very clearly distinguished from the old covenant. The old covenant being the Mosaic covenant, the context here in these verses makes that very clear. It's going to be different than the covenant that was made with Moses. And uh, it's interesting there, notice this reference, they broke my covenant though I was their husband. For those of you who don't know, the entire book of Deuteronomy is written as a marriage covenant and the it is typically seen as a second giving of the law but actually the giving of the law is seen elsewhere in the old testament the book of deuteronomy is the is the packaging of the law as a marriage covenant because it is uh, that covenant that creates this relationship between God and Israel. And while we're talking about God and Israel, notice in verse 31, I'm going to make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. The scriptures could not be clearer over who God is, or rather with whom God is making the covenant. The covenant with Moses, Exodus chapter 20, and all the scripture there following, is a covenant that God made with Israel. If you were a Gentile, Uh, you were not obliged to keep Mosaic Covenant. But as we've seen in our studies, if you wanted to follow the God of Israel, that covenant, that law, acts as a big wall of partition, Ephesians 2, between the Jew and the Gentile. And you would have to go over that wall and get away from the Gentiles who are separated, become into the camp of the Jews, as it were, as many did in Israel's history, come into the camp of the Jews and proselytize, convert to Judaism. That did not make you a Jew. 
The Jews were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and they still are to this day. But it meant that you were associated with them, you took their law upon yourself and, uh, and that was the way to have relationship with God. Now, we now know that today in Christ that wall of partition has been torn down and the Gentile can come to God without that wall of partition because it's no longer there. It's been brought to an end with the death of Christ. We talked about that in our Ephesian studies. So from our perspective tonight with where we're going, we need to remember that the, the old covenant was made with Israel and this new covenant that is clearly going to be distinct and different this new covenant that's being promised is a covenant that's going to be made with Israel as well. Very, very clear in the context here. Very, very clear in the context leading up to it, which we don't have time to go through, but also clear in the context that follows, which we will have a quick look at. Verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Again, he reiterates the covenants with Israel. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Right. Now this is the promise of the new covenant. We've seen other aspects of it in other passages, but let's just focus on this one for today, all right? In this passage, God is saying that he's going to write this new law in their hearts. Ezekiel talks about it as being an actual new heart. It's clearly referring to the same thing. Ezekiel and Isaiah talks about those terms. Ezekiel clarifies as well and, and talks about the giving of the Spirit. And so we have this new spirit, this new heart, this law being written on the heart. These are different ways of expressing the same truth. And what we've seen in our studies coming through that transition, that we now as new covenant believers have this new heart. Because the Spirit of God has been given to us, that's what distinguishes us new covenant believers. The Spirit of God has been given to us, and this promise of a new heart has been fulfilled. Now, as we understand, very, very experientially and also theologically, is that unfortunately we do continue to sin, because though we have a new heart, we still have the old one as well, for now. But eventually our bodies will, will end, they will come to their, their, their fulfillment, shall we say, and we will ultimately be given new bodies, and our new bodies won't have this old heart, but we'll still have our new heart. And then things will be very different. And praise God that that day is coming, right? Now, so what has been promised is this law being written on the hearts, and the result is that each one won't have to say to his neighbor and his brother, know the Lord, they will all know me from the least unto the greatest. So, I don't need to come to, yes, I, I don't know all of you very well, but I know enough of you well enough to know that there are several of you here, that I don't have to come to you and say, I need you to trust in Jesus as your Savior. Because I know for a fact that you did it a long time ago, that you are his, that there's evidence that you're his, and that you have the Spirit of God within you. You, like me, are a new covenant believer, and I don't need to teach you the gospel. I mean, obviously, we can be reminded of the gospel, reminded of what Christ done, grow in knowledge, but you haven't got to be converted, and that's what's being said here. So, in that sense, what's been promised in the new covenant, we as new covenant believers can, can you know, we can... Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? We can acknowledge this. We can, we can, we can see this in our own lives and our own hearts. Um, and finally, the last little bit of that, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. That is absolutely central to who we are, our faith and what we believe and what's been accomplished by God in us. Everything that we've been studying in Ephesians, we have had our sins forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. So we can see how that basically has been to a degree fulfilled in our lives. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that this was a promise to the Jews. And it says specifically that each one of them won't have to tell their neighbor. Now, I, I learned the other day that, that, that one of our congregation is in fact Jewish. And that's great. And that Jewish person can go to Jewish friends and Jewish family and, and does 
does, you know, when we go, if, if a Jewish believer in Christ goes to Jewish family, is there no need for them to ever share the gospel with any of their Jewish family or friends because they're Jews? No, 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 there's a desperate need for it. Because most Jews don't believe that Jesus is their Messiah. So Jeremiah 31 is a, is a problematic passage. Because we're looking here at this new covenant. And it's a promise to the Jews that has not been fulfilled in the Jewish people. It's something that was going to happen in the future. And as we've seen in our studies, as we go through this transitionary period in the Gospels and Acts, and we look then in Ephesians at where we stand today as New Covenant believers, that it's very apparent that we now are living fulfillments of this to, as individuals, and yet the passage hasn't been fulfilled. So what do we do with that? Well, the majority of the church today, I think it's pretty much the majority, and I mean this church, I mean Church Universal, will simply say, well, we are Israel. Which is utterly, to my mind, ridiculous. Um, I would like to really take the whole time to do an entire sermon on this concept. Some people will call it replacement theology. The idea that the promises that were given to Israel, that we have replaced Israel and taken those promises. None of the curses, mind you. We don't want those. We'll just take the promises. Not the ones about the land, because we're going to spiritualize those away. But all the good stuff that we want, we'll take those promises. Less of a replacement, more of a smash and grab, I think. And then others today will refine it slightly differently and say, well, it's not replacement because... It's not like we've taken over what was theirs. There's just this one kind of generic glob of the people of God and they used to be it and we are now it. And so the promises were ours all along. Well, that's just bad interpretation. The reality is, is it's very, very clear that this promise is to two groups here, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, because at this point the kingdom's divided. So it's to the Jewish people very specifically delineated. And he's saying to those Jewish people, the time is coming when you don't need to convert your brother and teach him the truth anymore and say, hey, know Yahweh. You don't have to do that anymore because they already know. Every one of them. Now, where in Israel's history, when Israel is the people of God, do we have any point in time in Israel's history where everybody in Israel knows the Lord in the sense of salvation? And the answer, there isn't a point in history. It hasn't ever happened. In fact, for the majority of Israel's history, most of them needed converting. And there were times, like in the times of the Elijah and Elisha, when the situation was so bad, they wondered, is, is, is there any point? Is there anyone left? Because most of Israel have departed from the Lord. And so... And then, then when we come out from these verses and we come to the very next verse, thus says the Lord, verse 35, who gives sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the um, stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me forever. It's almost as if God knew how Christians were going to twist the Old Testament scriptures in advance. Funny that. He knew what we were going to do. And he says, look, before Israel as a nation ceases to exist, the sun and the moon and the stars will all be gone and done. God is, is stating his claim as creator, creator of the celestial bodies as we call them, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the the creator of the sea and the waves, that he as creator God is staking his name on the fact that the offspring of Israel, those descended from Israel, will not cease to be a nation. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth can be explored, then I will cast off the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Well, just recently Hubble sent back some new pictures, so we're still exploring the universe, so Israel still exists. And so, with this giving of the new covenant... It is very, very clear contextually, and I'm not going to do that week's sermon about it because I think most people here get it and there's no need for it. But 
when God speaks of Israel, he speaks of Israel. And as I said to you in my studies in Ephesians, is the people of God in the Old Testament weren't all saved. And that is why Paul's revelation of the Jews and Gentiles coming together into one body, one new man, the church, was such a mystery, such a revelation. In, the, in this new one body, everybody is saved. And, and yet, Jeremiah 31 is not fulfilled. Part of it's true, it's true in my life, it's true in your life, but it's not yet fulfilled. So in the future, we're, we're going to have to see a fulfillment of this because God has staked his very name on this. So what is the... And, and this is really where we now shift from present to future. To the remainder of the evening, what I'm going to be explaining is the present situation for Israel, for Jews, and how that will shift in the future. And then next week we'll start to look in more details at how that future will come about. Okay? So, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Now, it's not possible in half an hour to teach through these three chapters of Romans. The way some reformed commentaries are written, you might think it was possible, though. There are commentaries where they, they have books that thick on the first eight chapters of Romans, and then there's a few pages of 9, 10, and 11, because it's a little bit awkward for people. But I think when we have our background that we've had in a series, and we've had our background in Ephesians, this shouldn't be too difficult for us. I'm going to skim very, very briefly over the surface. At the beginning of chapter 9, Paul says that, he says, this is my, the truth in Christ, this is my conscience. He's got a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I could cut my, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That to me is one of the most remarkable, no, let me scratch that. I've studied Paul fairly well over the years. That, to me, is the most remarkable statement that Paul makes anywhere in Scripture. He says, I wish that I... This, Paul, Paul, just remember who's saying this. Paul, who understood what it meant to be in Christ more than anybody else. Who saw things that no one else saw to be able to understand the gospel, to understand what it meant to be in Christ. He understood the depths of that more than I will ever know. He says, I wish I could be cut off from Christ so my Jewish brothers could be in Christ. Don't get it, don't understand it. I, I, as a parent, I understand kind of like sacrificing myself, willingly giving my life so that maybe my wife or kids could live, you know. And I think in this day and age, that's a hard thing. But, but many of us would probably be prepared to do that if the time came to it. But would you give up your salvation for anyone? I mean, I don't know. I'm not even going to try and exegete it. It's just there, all right? And this kicks off Paul. He starts off with this foundation of, of uncompromising love for the Jewish people. And this is now what he's going to talk about, the Jews. And he says... They are Israelites, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. Who were the covenants made with? They were made with, in this context, his brothers, kinsmen, according to the flesh. Not descendants of the Spirit, not children of Abraham in the sense of having faith, like we're children of Abraham, we share in his faith. Physical descendants. They're the ones who have the covenants. It's their covenants. So Paul is in this section addressing head on the problem. The problem is he loves the Jews. The Jews are, are, are on the whole not saved. The majority aren't saved. And yet they have the covenants. That's the problem we're trying to resolve. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race. According to the flesh is Christ who is God over all Blessed forever. Amen. By the way, it's a lovely verse expressing the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus comes from the Jews. He's descended from the Jews in his humanity. He's man. And yet he is God over all. That's a lovely, lovely little verse. I'm going to get distracted. I've got a lot to do. Okay. So in this section, 
He is then trying to deal with it. So he says in verse 6, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are, his ch are, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Okay. Now, some will twist this passage to try and mean that we are descendants of Abraham, we're, you know, we're descendants of Israel, and we are Israel and all of this. It's simply, it's not just talking about Jews and Gentiles here. The, the Jews and Gentiles thing is, is separate. This context is Paul talking about the Jews. And he's saying, not all Jews are children of Abraham. So he's not, just, he's not saying anything about Gentiles here at all. He's talking about that same division that we saw in this series when we looked at the circumcision of the heart versus the circumcision of the flesh. There are those who are part of, who in the Old Testament were part of God's people. They were part of God's covenant people. They were under God's covenant. And they were designated as part of that covenant by being circumcised in the flesh. But Jeremiah had to say to them, that's not enough. You've got to be circumcised in your heart as well. You've got to be saved. So you had this covenant people, the people of God, but they still need to be saved as individuals. And it's that distinction that Paul's making here. That the word of God hasn't failed. God has kept his promises to the people, to, to Israel and their covenant. But what's happened is, is that not all of them are saved. And that's why the promises aren't applying to them. Why is it that your Jewish neighbor doesn't have the Holy Spirit in his heart and doesn't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, typically speaking? It's because he's not saved. Well, how does that happen? How does that come to be? Well, initially in chapter 9, Paul deals with, deals with the fairness and the unfairness of his all. He deals with the sovereignty of God and... Uh, and we will leave that for, for, for the sake of the flow and the context. But uh, he simply argues that God has the right to do that. And he concludes the chapter. Let's pick up again in verse 30. What shall we say then? So having argued the basis of God's sovereign um, will to be able to do as he wishes with the Jews. He then, then says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. So here's the problem. The issue is, is that people like me go about our lives dead in Christ, not interested in God. And God who cho chose us takes us and says, I'm having you now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you. And he takes us. And he takes people like me when I have no pursuit of God in my own heart at all. And yet, at the same time, Israel have the law, have the covenant. And there they are. And you can go to a synagogue. Just, there was one just down the road over there. And you can go there. And they're meticulous about the law. They try and keep the law. And they are pursuing God. And they're pursuing righteousness. And yet, we are claiming that they don't have that righteousness that they're pursuing. And me, who never pursued righteousness, I'm righteous. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? Is, and so Paul says, after dealing with this whole chapter about fairness and sovereignty, he says, is that, how, is that the case? Is that how it is? Why is it the case, verse 32? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as if it were based on works. In other words, they tried to keep the law, they tried to keep the law, they tried to keep the law, and they never got there. They never got righteousness by being good enough, because you never can. The way to pursue righteousness was by faith. And so they have stumbled over the stumbling stone, as we understand that is Christ. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Now you see cleverly what Paul's doing at the end of this chapter as he shifts. He's talking about the stone of Christ stumbling the Jew who are pursuing righteousness by works. But then it says, whoever believes in him, not just the Jews, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And he's introducing this concept of Gentile salvation. And so he says in chapter 10, kicks off, Brothers, my heart, desire and prayer to God is for them that they'll be saved. I have, I bear, 
Uh, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Isn't that great? That's just, I, I don't even need to say much on this. It just, it talks for itself. The Jews, they, they, they may well have a zeal for God, but they they don't understand. This is what we've been seeing in Ephesians. This is prayer for knowledge and how much difference knowledge makes. They don't understand and so their zeal is wasted because they're ignorant of the righteousness of God. They're trying to get their own righteousness. They haven't submitted to God's righteousness. And what is God's righteousness? Christ. There they are trying to keep the law and Christ is the end of the law. They're trying to follow the law and the law was pointing them to the one that they're rejecting. They're stumbling over him. And again, what does Paul cleverly do at the end? Christ is the end of law, the law for righteousness. Righteousness now comes through Christ to everyone who believes. That same transition. And so he then goes on in the remainder of chapter 10 to argue, and many of you will have in your Bibles quotations from the Old Testament put aside in sort of as, as a separate uh, indent in your Bible. Some will have the quotations in italics. Um, either is fine, but you'll note that Paul is making an argument in the remainder of chapter 10 that this is nothing new and that it was always stated that people would be saved and that Gentile, uh, sorry, the, the people who weren't Jews and Gentiles will be saved. Uh, I just want to briefly bring your attention to one part of this, which is often misunderstood. In the, this next section, uh, he says, uh, let's pick it up from verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I think this is misunderstood here. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And at this point, people get into you know, the Lordship of Christ and obeying Christ. That's not what the context is saying. Because as he goes on, he says at the end of this section, um, verse 11, For the scriptures say, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. He's repeating what he said at the end of chapter 9. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Quoting Joel chapter 2. And in Joel, that word Lord is Yahweh. It's the name of God. So when he's saying in this context, you have to confess that Jesus is Lord, because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved, he's equating Jesus with Yahweh. He's calling Jesus God. This is a declaration of the deity of Jesus Christ. The Jews were told by Joel, and remember the context of Joel chapter 2, the pouring out of the Spirit, the giving of the new covenant, all of Israel being saved. We've seen that in our studies. In Joel chapter 2, he says that the Spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh, context Jews, all types of Jews, not just the leaders as we saw in the old covenant, not just the, the rulers, but all of Israel will have the Spirit. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the Jews saw Joel chapter 2 as being this passage that spoke of Jewish salvation, which contextually it is. But there's that little snippet at the end. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now the Jews were very clear. Who is it that you're calling upon? Well, you're calling upon Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of Moses. That's the one you're calling on. And now Paul is, is taking that concept and he's applying it to Christ. You have to confess that Jesus is Lord. Now notice, because we're skimming, it's quite nice because you get to see context. The context is, just at the end of the previous chapter, that the Jews have rejected Christ because he's a stumbling stone for them. What's the resolution? You Jews need to confess that Jesus is Yahweh. He's not some false prophet. He's not some false messiah. He is Yahweh. So you can't just go and worship God by keeping his law. He has now come in the person of Christ, which has brought about the end of the law for righteousness. 
And now if you want to worship God, you need to worship Christ because he's Lord. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You've got to confess Jesus with your lips that he's Lord. In other words, you've got to turn. In the same way that you Jews think that you're turning to Yahweh, you need to turn to Christ. See, in context, it's the most marvelous passage. And Christians just get wrench it from its context and talk about lordship and obeying Jesus and all this kind of stuff and they're missing the point he's talking to Jews and he's talking about them recognizing that Jesus is the God who they claim to worship it's an amazing passage in context anyway I couldn't leave that without mentioning it so I had to kind of slip that in there but it's good it it keeps with our flow and so he um He talks about Israel not understanding. He talks about them being blind. And he ends the chapter. Let's wrap up the chapter, verse 21. But of Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And so Israel has a history of rejecting God and turning from God. And I guess what he's saying here in this context is he's saying their rejection of Christ is not unusual. They've always rejected God, (laughs) historically. And, And by the way, here, in, in, this, in this verse, is Israel referring to the church? Are people going to try and equate the two? <laughs> Clearly not. He's talking about historical Israel in this context. And by the way, the word Israel is used over 70 times. I think it is 70. It might be 72. I have to think. I think it's 70 times in the New Testament. Every single time the word Israel is used, it refers to people who are physically, genetically descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It never refers to anything else. Some people say, oh, but this passage doesn't refer to spiritual Israel and believing Israel. Well, yes, there are. Because most of Israel are unbelieving. So spiritual Israel and and, and believing Israel are the Jews physically who believe as well. They're the remnant. And they're the people we're going to see now as we hit chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? So here we are. The Jews have rejected Christ. Is that because God has rejected them? By no means. You know what? I read theology book after theology book with great men who read the scriptures and just can't get their head around this thing that we're talking about tonight. They, they can't see that Israel and the church are different. And, you know, essentially, as far as they're concerned, God has rejected Israel. And it's pointless saying, well, he hasn't rejected Israel because we're Israel and he hasn't rejected us. Just in the previous verse, he, but of Israel, he says all day long. I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Are you saying, that's us as well? Of course not. Every, this whole context is talking about the, what God's doing with physical Israel. When he talks about them being blinded and not being saved. Is he talking about the church being blinded and not saved? Of course not. The whole point of the church is the people who are saved. So clearly he's talking about Israel. And he says of this Israel, has God rejected Israel? So to say, well, he hasn't rejected Israel in the sense that we've become Israel is utter twist. It's it's like the worst car salesman who's trying to sell you a beat up car and pretending that it's good. It's twisting and it's slippery and it's sneaky and it's not my God. Has God finished with Israel? By no means. The same phrase that Paul used earlier in the book of Romans saying, shall we continue to sin so that grace may abound? By no means. It's the strongest possible negation available to him in the Greek language. No, God hasn't finished with Israel. So that's kind of, you can see how we're flowing now into the answer. Here's our problem, Jeremiah 31. He said he's going to do this to people. He's done it to us. He's done it for the church, but he hasn't done it for the rest of Israel. Has he finished with Israel? No way. Absolutely not. Not on your nelly. Not a chance. So, let's see what he says. Uh, By no means. He says, for I myself am an Israelite. And so Paul basically uses himself as an example. God hasn't finished with Israel because some Jews are saved. And he goes on to argue, this is always the way. Did you not know, verse 2, that the scripture said of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? And he says, and he quotes here now from the Old Testament, Lord, they have killed your prophets, they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. Elijah says, that's it, they've killed everyone. The prophets are all dead, no one believes in you, it's only me, God, it's only me. Hero complex. And God, what does God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. 
He has kept for himself 7,000 men who haven't. How big was Israel? I don't know exactly, but it was hundreds of thousands of people at that time. But hey, I've kept this tiny percentage. That's the remnant. And there is a whole remnant theology I won't get into tonight, but this simply suffice to say this. The concept of the remnant of Israel is this principle established at the time of Elijah that no matter how, things ba how bad things get in Israel's history, God always keeps a remnant for himself. He's never quite finished with Israel. It's never so bad that they're done. In every moment in history, from, from the, the calling of Abraham and onwards, every single moment in history, there has been a saved Jew. There has never been a time when, the, when there has been no saved Jews. He's always kept a remnant. Um, so, verse 5 of 11, so, verse 5, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. Today is no worse than the days of Elijah. There are Jews who believe today. And that is a good thing, that there are Jews who believe today. And there is a remnant, and God hasn't finished, and they are chosen by grace. But if it is by grace... It is no longer on the basis of works, otherwise grace will no longer be grace. And so, there is salvation, but it can't, as he's been saying already in this section, it can't be earned through keeping the law. It is by God's grace that we are saved. So, here we get into the crucial bit now. This is where we're going to slow down a little. What then? Israel, so he's asking now, because of all this, Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, those who were chosen, that's what elect means, but the rest were hardened. So not only are some elect and chosen, but some are hardened. As it is written, God gave to them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see and ears would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and, their, and bend their backs forever. In other words, God has deliberately and specifically blinded Israel. Why? Because they rejected the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. Now we've done this already in this series. If you weren't here for this week, I that week I apologize. But here's, here's the key thing. That Jesus came and he was the Messiah. He was the, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament scripture and he was there in their midst. And when they rejected him, when they rejected, they did so, and they had to then explain, how is it that this man is not of God? How come if he's not the Messiah? How is it that he does all these miracles that he does? How is it that he does what he does? And the leadership of Israel decided he does it by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. He's able to cast out demons because he's got a higher ranked demon in him. In other words, even though he does all these good things, even though he heals these people, he's a wicked man. And Jesus said, this sin won't be forgiven. It's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And as I told you at the time, that's not a sin that you or I can commit. It was a sin that was committed by national Israel. And there was this parallel. In the old covenant, Israel was about to be judged. Times of Jeremiah. Their temple was about to be destroyed. They were about to be cast out of the land. And it was the sin of Manasseh that was the tipping point. And God said, right now, because of the sin of Manasseh, has filled up, this is going to happen. You're going to be cast out of the land, you're going to be exiled, you're going to have the temple destroyed, you're going to, there's going to be judgment coming. And then what happens? Manasseh repents. <sighs> well, what do you do? Well, the answer is, in, in his, historically, that the judgment was delayed. But it couldn't not happen because the sin of the people had been filled up. In other words, there was no, t they'd reached the tipping point and there was no turning back. In the New Covenant, exactly the same thing happened. Matthew is a parallel in the New Testament to what Jeremiah tells us in the Old Testament. 
And in, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, we see this parallel with Jeremiah, where Israel reaches that tipping point, and Jesus says, this sin won't be forgiven. And he makes it very clear in that context, five separate times, this generation is the one who's committed the sin. You and I can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit and never be forgiven. That's nonsense. Everything can be forgiven. But the, what he's saying is, is that what they had done in rejecting his Messiahship, that that national sin for them as a nation could not be revoked. It was over. There was now judgment coming upon them. And just like in Jeremiah's day, this temple was destroyed. Just like in Jeremiah's day, they were exiled out of the land. And just like in Jeremiah's day, there was a change of heart. Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna. Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And just as in Jeremiah's day, it was too late. And so the judgment came upon Israel. And what Paul is saying here in Romans 11 is he's saying part of that judgment upon Israel is a deliberate blindness and a deliberate hardening of the hearts of Israel, which is why the remnant today is so few. Still, despite that national blindness, there are individuals who are saved by grace. Because God has not yet finished with them. Now, verse 11. So I asked, did they stumble in order they might, they might fall? No means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. And so, is God mean and nasty? By hardening the hearts of Israel. Well he's saying there's two purposes. To God's sovereign hardening of Israel. Purpose number one. Is it allows for this mass salvation of Gentiles. That we have now today. In the past. Salvation was there with Israel. And the Gentiles had to come over that wall of partition. And proselytize. And take the law upon themselves. And now that God has taken that down. Now that he's created this one new man. The church. Jew and Gentile. Together in one body. Now the way has been opened. For all the Gentiles to be saved. And people like. You know. In this church. You know. That we. You know. Very few Jews. Lots of Gentiles. And it's the same for pretty much every church. Across the land. And mostly across the world. That's how it is. And so the Jewish blindness has allowed for the Gentiles to come in. And then in addition to that, the Gentiles coming in is designed to make the Jews jealous. Now, Jews are okay with Christians generally. Not always like them. But most Jews really don't like the Jews for Jesus. They don't like the, the converted Jews, the Christian Jews, the believing Jews. Why? Because what we're doing is we're taking their imagery, their language, everything that they say about their Messiah and saying, we've got him. And they get angry because, no, no, no he's not the Messiah. He's not the Messiah. That's not the Messiah. He can't be the Messiah. And so they get angry about it. And there is a lot of Jewish vitriol against Jews for Jesus and groups like that, Ariel Ministries and all these kind of things, who are, who are reaching out to Jewish communities with the gospel. It's all right if you're, if you're a Christian and you want to do some sort of missionary activity that's just targeted to some nation that comprises of Jews and Gentiles. That's fine. But don't go targeting the Jews with our Jewish language and our Jewish Messiah. Boy, they don't want that. And yet, that's the whole point. We have their Messiah. Now, if the trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more would their full inclusion mean? This is a very important verse. If the sin of Israel means riches for the Gentiles, if them failing means riches for the Gentiles, so their sin and failure... His, is being used in the wisdom of God as being a great thing for us, yes? Then how much better is it going to be for us when they don't sin and when they do believe? Now, we see what Paul's done in this whole study. He's gone full circle, in the, as we've skimmed over these chapters. He's gone full circle. And the question that we came to this passage with, we got our problem in Jeremiah 31. Here's the new covenant. We can see that in our lives, right? We can see it. We believe it. It's true for us. But the promise was given to the Jews. And it hasn't happened to the Jews. And it was promised to the Jews en masse. And we saw Joel and how everybody in, in, in Israel is going to experience this. 
Has this, has this now been reneged? Is it not going to happen anymore? And Paul's gone through his whole process of thinking with the Jews. And now, just now, he's starting to introduce that concept. If their sin and their failure and their blindness is good news in the hands of God for other people, then the lack of sin, them having a full inclusion again, them being restored, them being saved, how much better is that going to be? And Paul is immediately now hinting that all of these prophecies that we'd seen about the Jews being saved, about the time coming when every living Jew will be saved, that were promised by all of the prophets, that that's still going to happen. He started, just like he started to hint when we were going through chapters 9 and 10, that he started to hint that, that everyone can be saved. Everyone can be saved. Then he comes out and says it clearly. Now he's starting to hint again. He's starting to open up this thought of the Jewish salvation. And he says, now I am speaking to you Gentiles. So that's important because the context previously has all been him talking to the Jews about what's happening with the Jewish situation. Now he specifically opens up the context to the Gentiles. In as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. And he talks about his ministry. Now he says, um, if, the, if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And he's using a principle there from Numbers 15, and it's really beyond the scope of keeping an eye on the clock and the time today. But suffice to say, he's essentially reiterating that the God working through the rejection of Israel to bring the reconciliation of the Gentiles means that when they do accept, it's going to be so much better. Because the first fruits, the God planting the seeds in Israel. Israel was a work of God, and it was a good work of God. And therefore, the fruits that come from Israel will ultimately be good. Because the, the beginning was good, so the end will be good. It's God's plan. Okay? Now, this is the key bit. And we're going to have to skip it because I've taken so long to get here. But let's try. If some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant towards the, br the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. Okay, so this is the famous olive tree passage. The immediately preceding verse talks about um, the, the, the dough and the lump and the root and the branches. The root is holy. God started Israel. He chose Abraham. Right? He chose Isaac as the son. And he chose Jacob as a son. And he chose that line to be his people. He chose it. So that root is holy, the fruit is going to be holy. And on that principle, he says, and here's the point. If some of the branches were broken off, now, he's talking to Gentiles here, although you, Gentiles, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others. So God has done this work with Israel. Okay, he's done this work. The olive tree is not Israel. That's where some people go wrong. It's very clear that the branches are Israel. The roots are the patriarchs, him starting it. And the Israel are Israel because they're, they are the ones attached to the patriarchs. So the fruit that is going to come from Israel is the fruit that comes from God's origin of Israel. Okay, So the tree itself isn't Israel, but the fruit that's going to come from this tree is God's blessings, and he says there will be good fruit because the roots are good. That's your patriarchs, right? Now, we Gentiles are these wild branches that are grafted on. Now at this point, some commentaries will tell you, well, Paul's not very good at horticulture, because you, you can't graft wild branches on. They won't be productive. That's the whole point. The point is, in the real world, if you take a wild olive branch and try and graft it onto a cultivated olive branch, you're not going to get any fruit. You can't do it. But God has done it. And it makes no sense. Because it's God doing something miraculous. Right? And he takes us Gentiles and he attaches us. He grafts us onto this tree. This tree of, that will produce good fruit of blessing. And he attaches us on. 
And really now we're coming to the crux of this solution to our problem. How is it that I, a Gentile, have a new heart? How is it that I have forgiveness from sins that were promises given to the Jews under the new covenant? Paul is now answering that question. He's saying, you've been grafted on. You shouldn't be able to produce fruit, but God's done it. And he says... um, If some of the branches were broken off, so who are the branches broken off? That's the Jews. So Jews have been broken off. Have they ceased to be Israel? Did people who were in Israel in the past who didn't believe, did they cease to be part of that nation? No, they were still part of that nation, which is why they were under such judgment. But they ceased to be part of spiritual Israel. They ceased to be believing Jews. They weren't, the, the Jews who were broken off were the ones who were not broken off from Israel. They were still Jews. They were broken off from the place of blessing. The salvation, the fruit of salvation is not their fruit. Why? Because they've been broken off. Now, you who've been grafted in, that's us who are Gentiles, don't be arrogant towards the branches. Don't think you're better than those Jews. If you are, remember, it's not you who supports the root, but the root who supports you. I, as a Gentile, am not better than a Jewish believer. And there is something in the heart of our faith which is hard to fully explain. Paul says in Romans, right back in chapter 1 of Romans, he says... That, um, that the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. There's something that is, that is uniquely special. There is a love for the Jewish people that should be in our hearts as Christians. Why? Because the only reason that I stand here forgiven today and saved is because of the Jews. You say, well, is it because of God? Well, yes, it is because of God. But God used the Jews to do it. That makes them special. And that makes a Jewish person being saved a special thing. That means that the gospel is, is, is in some way, shape or form, no, I'm not going to deal with that tonight, but in some way, shape or form, is, is theirs first. Because the fruit of the gospel is the fruit of the new covenant. And it's their covenant. Theirs. It's their right. I don't have any right to it. I've been grafted on. In, in some bizarre miracle. So then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that's true, verse 20. They were broken off because of their unbelief, and you stand fast, fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. By the way, if anybody tries to use this as a passage to teach the losing of salvation, you are out of context. It is not saying that you as an individual singular, can be broken off and therefore no longer have the fruit of salvation. The whole of what Paul teaches in Ephesians is that you're given the Spirit which guarantees God's future work of redemption. What he's saying is the Jewish people have been broken off so that Gentiles can be grafted in. So don't get arrogant Gentiles because God can stop dealing with Gentiles again. It's talking as a group rather than as individuals. So that's what that passage is saying. But it's basically talking against Gentile arrogance. For God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Verse 22. Note the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you provided you, plural, the Gentiles, the nations, continue in his kindness. Otherwise you too, plural, will be cut off. And even they, if they do not, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in... For God has the power to graft them in again. So, here are the Jews. The Jewish people, with the exception of a few, have been cast off, broken off, and cast off from the the tree. They're no longer producing fruit. There's no spiritual fruit from Israel as a whole. They're predominantly speaking, Jews are unbelievers. Predominantly speaking. Though, at the beginning of the chapter, there's still a remnant. Okay? But if they believe... If they believe, God can graft them back in again and the fruit that was always supposed to come from them can still come from them. 
4, verse 24, if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? In other words, it's not possible in nature to take a wild olive branch and graft it and produce fruit. But he's done it through wild branches like us Gentiles. It's a miracle. So if he can do that, how much easier is it for him to take the Jews and to give them the blessings that were always theirs by right? All that we're waiting for is for them to believe. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until, until, there's an ending of this blindness, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So God has chosen so many Gentiles to be saved. When that fullness of Gentiles, when all those Gentiles have been saved, then God will go back to saving the Jews. And look at this verse 26. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. Not all Israel historically. Those who died in their sin, died in their sin. But there will come a point in history where what Jeremiah prophesied, this is where we began, about an hour ago, what Jeremiah prophesied, that, all, that the Jews would have a new heart, they wouldn't, you, you, they wouldn't go to their Jewish neighbor and say, hey, do you, need, do you hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because they'll all be saved. And as Joel says in chapter 2, their spirit will be poured out on them all, and everyone will have the spirit, because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what are we waiting for then for this to come? How is this, how is this new covenant understanding that we've seen, we've, we've traced through this whole series. We've looked at the history of the Holy Spirit and the life of the believer. And the last piece of our puzzle is just coming together now. We have seen the work of the Holy Spirit come to his completion in the new covenant believers but we've been left with this problem the problem is is we're not supposed to be new covenant believers Jews are and the solution is this God says I've chosen to harden the hearts of Israel for now so that the Gentiles can come in but when the fullness of Gentiles has come in that hardness that blindness will be lifted and that promise, those promises of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, of Isaiah, those promises of the minor prophets, that the, the, the Jewish people totally, completely, every living Jew will be saved, that that will still come to fruition. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. No sin left in Israel. And this will be my covenant with them. He's referring back to the covenant when I take away their sins. That's exactly where we started. The new covenant is the forgiving of sins. And that covenant is coming to who? Jacob. In the New Testament, in the context of everything Paul's been saying about Israel, he says physical Israel will see the fulfillment of the new covenant and they will be without sin and they will be saved. And it will happen. And that can't refer to the church, because for the church it's already happened. And it's saying that it will happen. It really couldn't be clearer, and it's really not complicated. So next time, we will go through history from God's perspective, but from our perspective, future history. And we will look at how is this going to happen. And that's when it gets kind of exciting. So we'll do some end time stuff next time as we go through that. And uh, let's just pray and conclude our study now. Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that, uh, Lord, you would put in us a, a heart and a love for the Jewish people. And uh, that we would be ever grateful that this miracle of us Gentiles, wild branches, receiving salvation fruit from a source that was never ours to begin with. Theirs are the patriarchs. Theirs are the covenants. And yet, Lord, we receive the promises of them. Lord, we thank you for your mercy towards us. We thank you, Lord, in a sense for their rejection that we might be saved. But Lord, may we rejoice that there is a day coming when your covenants will be fulfilled and your people Israel will be saved. Amen.